I think that um, early on I became convinced of the value of probability as a guide to life. That saying goes back to Bishop Butler. Um, and um, I made that saying my own. Um, I use probability as a, a guide to life and it's been valuable for me that way. A lot of advice about what to do is non-probabilistic, but the advice seems better if you make it probabilistic, if you take probability into account. Welcome everyone to today's interview, where I'm very, very pleased to welcome Professor Paul Weirich. He is Curator's Distinguished Professor in the Philosophy Department at the University of Missouri, and his work has focused primarily on decision theory, uh, game theory, rationality, uh, and logic. His books include, among others, Decision Space, Multidimensional Utility Analysis, uh, Realistic Decision Theory, Collective Rationality, Equilibrium and Cooperative Games, uh, rational rational responses to risk uh, and rational choice using imprecise probabilities and utilities. Um, he also has a variety of published articles. Feel free to uh, to add anything. But that, with that, welcome and thanks so much for being here, Professor Weirich. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm delighted to have a chance to talk about philosophy. Awesome. Yeah, and I'm um, I especially like some of the some of the work that you. Um, well, some of the subjects that you work on is I have uh, um, my own interest in like decision theory and and uh, agency and some of the surrounding issues there. So I did want to, well, there's a few things I want to cover. I think I want to start on some of you've worked on like collective agency and rationality um, and like group rationality. And so I was, I was thinking, um, like when I think about it anyway, when I think of like agency and rationality, I'm normally talking about things or subjects acting based on their beliefs and desires, usually with some like deliberation involved. Um, and I don't like normally think about groups as like having those things, but they're kind of similar in some ways, you know, um, they exhibit some of the same features. And so we can sort of talk about them in a similar way as, um, as agents and accessible for rationality. Um, I don't know, is that kind of roughly how you would think about it, but how would you think about, broadly speaking, group yes. rationality? So I think that groups can perform acts. Um, a committee can pass a resolution, for instance. Um, now, I, I think that, like you, um, committees, groups, they don't have minds and so don't literally have beliefs and desires and don't literally make decisions or form intentions. But despite that, I think they do act. And because they act, their acts can be evaluated for rationality. So not only do they act, but they act freely. Um, committees, when they pass a resolution, um, do that without coercion. They freely perform an act. And if it's an act that's free, then I think it's a valuable for rationality. Standards of rationality apply. And I'm interested in figuring out which standards apply to collective acts. I don't think they're the same standards as apply to the acts of individuals. So it makes a difference that the acts of individuals are ones that the individual has direct control over. Whereas a group acts only through the acts of its members. It doesn't um, have, as an agent, have direct control over the acts it performs. So instead of evaluating um, a group's act for maximization of utility, as you might for an individual, I think you'd evaluate a group's act by looking at the acts 
of the members that comprise the group SAC. So I advance a sufficient condition for a group's X rationality if the acts of individuals that constitute the group's X are all rational, then I say that suffices for the rationality of the group's act. Yeah, yeah, that, that's interesting. Yeah, and you talk about how um, it's like the compositionality of, of individual rationality to like group rationality is one way to put it maybe if, if each of them act rationally and they act like together and in this sort of joint way, um, then it, that's a sufficient condition for them acting, for the group being rational, uh, if that makes sense. Right. So some people think that the standards of collective rationality are higher, um, that it's not sufficient for the acts constituting the collective act to all be rational. Um, but, you know, I think that that compositional evaluation of the collective act is the right approach. So for instance, some think that in order for a collective act to be rational, it has to be Pareto optimal in the sense that there's no alternative that's better for every member of the group. But I think that standard of rationality for a collective act is too demanding. Um, I think of collective rationality as the extension of the ordinary notion of rationality from individuals to groups. Now the ordinary notion of rationality, um, it attributes blame to irrational agents. And so it takes into account the agent's circumstances, the agent's um, abilities and what situation the agent is in. Now, um, often, a group is not in an ideal situation for achieving Pareto optimality. Um, the members not be, might not be able to communicate with each other. For instance, they might not be able to coordinate. Um, if they were able to coordinate and communicate and to enter into binding agreements, then the standards of rationality for the group's acts would rise. But in many cases, communications blocked, coordinations blocked. And so I think the standards for collective rationality in those circumstances are less demanding. And all that's demanded is that the individuals act rationally when they're contributing to a collective act. Yeah, yeah, very good. And there's a few things I want to touch on here. One is, um, I think you say something like, and this maybe follows from what you've already said, is that um, if the group if the group acts irrationally, then at least some of the members do. Right? Can't be. I mean, it's kind of the reverse. Yeah. Right. Like all, but like, um, the reverse doesn't necessarily hold, or at least you don't commit to that. Right. The fact that some of them act irrationally doesn't entail that the group act irrationally. Like maybe one person doesn't. Right. Sometimes a group member's irrational act is inconsequential and so doesn't make a collective act that is part of irrational. So it could be that when a committee is voting to pass a resolution, um, some member irrationally votes against the resolution. Um, nonetheless, the resolution passes and it's the right resolution for the committee to pass. And so the collective act is rational despite some irrational vote of a committee member. It just happens that that particular vote is inconsequential. Right, is there, so that makes sense to me, but is there like a, some boundary like, or you know what I mean? Like um, suppose like half of the people act irrationally. Is like, is there a principle way to say like, okay, now the group act is irrational or maybe only a third of them or two thirds? Is there uh -huh. like a boundary, what would you say? Um, well, I would see what collective act would be performed if everyone's contribution were rational. And then if the group achieves that act, 
without the rationality of all members, then their collective act is rational. So I think what matters is whether what they do is the same as what they would have done had all acted rationally. Ah, okay. Um... So maybe, you know, if 50% um, don't act rationally, then in a particular case, the collective act won't be the one that they would have realized had all acted rationally. Um, right. So it will depend on the circumstances, whether, you know, it takes some um, 50% or, or some higher percentage, or maybe even some lower percentage, what percentage it takes would depend on the group's circumstances. Right, I'm just thinking like, is it, is it like possible then that everyone acts irrationally in the group, but all the same, collectively they do the same thing they would have done if they'd all acted rationally, if that makes sense? Um, so, you know, that might happen if um, um, by accident, their irrational mm -hmm. acts achieve the collective act that they would have performed if all had acted rationally. Then you might say the act itself receives a positive evaluation, but the way in which the agents achieve the act is defective. And so if you apply procedural standards there, they're not acting collectively in a rational way, even though the result is rational, the same as they would have achieved if they all had acted rationally. So there are different ways of evaluating collective acts. And one way just um, you know, assesses the act itself and puts aside procedures that led to the realization of the act. But sometimes when we evaluate a group and its acts, we think about the procedures that the group followed. And even if by chance they happen to produce a, a good act, we might say that their procedures were bad. They acted in an irrational way, although the result was an act that gets a positive evaluation. Yeah, okay, that, that definitely makes sense to me. I guess maybe there's even some other cases where, um, like in principle, maybe one person acts rationally and outweighs the other actions of the group together. And even though the rest of them were irrational in the way that they were acting, this one person was able to counteract that with their rational action, um, producing the result that like would have obtained had everyone acted rationally, if that makes sense. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe that fits the mold or what do you think? Yeah, so I mean, um, it may take just one person in a group to put in a call for help and that one person's act um, produces the help that the group needs and the result is the same as if all members of the group had acted in a rational way. So in some special cases, it may be enough for one member of a group acting on behalf of the group to produce a good result. Okay, yeah, that that's, uh, that seems sensible enough, I think. Um, so I, I wanted to bring up um, some potential dilemmas that might be raised. And I, I think I know how you might respond, but a, a few months ago, I talked with Professor Larry Temkin about his uh, well then upcoming book, uh, it's now released called uh, Being Good in a World of Need. And one thing he considers is the following sort of case. Um, suppose that we determine like of all the charities that there are that we might give to, there is one that um, for us and like, and for each individual, giving to that charity does the most good. Like the most we can do with our number of dollars that we might give is to give to that charity. However, if everyone does that, like acts rationally, giving to that single best charity, then, you know, that charity will give a lot of money and perhaps do a lot of good, but um, the result isn't optimal because um, all the other charities and all the other good causes will get like nothing. <laughs> and it may be the case that for the group, the best outcome would be that the contributions would be spread around somewhat 
maybe um, a lot would go to this really good charity, but some would go to others as well. Um, is, is, if that makes sense, is this a case where the compositionality, compositionality from individual rationality to group rationality fails? Or is it a case like where there isn't this like joint action um, or the requirements of rationality are less strict? And so this um, isn't really a problem. Do you kind of understand the example? Right. So standards of rationality for an agent depend on what the agent knows. So one relevant circumstance would be whether a donor knows what the other donors are doing. And if the donor knows that the other donors are giving to the charity that puts the money to best use, um, but that it's better for some of the, the less efficient charities to get some money to be maybe their promoting causes that would otherwise be neglected, then what's rational for that one donor to do might be to give to one of the other charities. So a lot will depend, I think, in that case on what the donors know about what the others are doing. And maybe they have opportunities to coordinate. The potential donors could meet and at a meeting, they could decide how to distribute their donations to make sure they go to charities in a way that's best overall. And there isn't just a single charity that receives all their donations. So given circumstances that allow for coordination and agreements between the donors, then they could uh, produce a better outcome than they could if they weren't able to coordinate and communicate and perhaps were in ignorance of what the others were doing. Yeah, yeah, that, that um, I think the like coordination and, and um, like planning at the outset is, is like, makes a big difference there that seems right and like I do see some potential issues though like if you think okay perhaps you think that other people are going to contribute to the um to the optimal charity well optimal being like well whatever the most effective charity is and so you know you think um if I contribute to some other good charity but not that one um we might approach the better distribution of uh charitable contributions but I don't know, maybe other people will think the same way. <laughs> then you get to this problem like, well, everyone's starting to give to other charities. And then um, mm -hmm. I don't know, you could still run into issues so you get with a with there's no communication right. there. Yeah. The problem's a bit like the prisoner's dilemma, where people, you know, two players can't communicate then um, each, although they would um, each end up better off doing the cooperative thing. It, you know, you know, they would be better if both did the cooperative thing. Each has an individual um, and as an incentive not to do the cooperative thing. And so if they're acting rationally and each doesn't do the cooperative thing, then they're worse off than if had both had done the cooperative thing. Now, in the prisoner's dilemma, the players don't have a chance to coordinate and communicate and enter binding agreements. So their circumstances aren't ideal for joint action. And for that reason, I think they have an excuse if they fail to achieve what's the best collective act they could have achieved. Yeah. They don't, yeah, we, they don't achieve Pareto optimality. They don't achieve the collective act that's best, but they've got an excuse. They weren't in good circumstances for pulling that off. Right. Yeah, I, I, we might come back to this um, when we talk more about um, decision theories, because I, I mean, like I would say, in my approach, in the case where the um, uh, participants in the pr pr prisoner's dilemma think that um, their action is likely to correlate um, positively with the other prisoners, uh, it there kind of makes sense to to take the uh, um, to the, the coordinating action. Um, so I'm a, kind of a fan of the evidentialist approach. I'm not really, yeah, but I don't know that might come up later. <laughs> yeah. So as you might know, I'm 
leaning toward causal decision theory rather than evidentialist decision theory. And so I'd say in a prisoner's dilemma, despite the correlation, since one prisoner's or one player's act has no causal influence on the act of the other, um, then each should do um, what maximizes utility for the individual. And that's the non-cooperative act. So maximizes yes. um, expected utility in the sense of causal decision theory. Right, right, but- um, so, You know, the dominant act. Yeah, although, um, yeah, this isn't really essential to um, thinking generally about like collective rationality and agency or really a lot of the stuff, but uh, anyway, um, it's related, I guess. Um, Maybe that will come back up. There was something else I wanted to talk about in terms of um, sequential problems, but um, actually, I might come. I, I think I'll come back to that in talking about um, decision theory more generally. Um, I did want to talk briefly about um, some of your stuff on risk and, and risk involved in uh, decision theories. So. Um, you've argued for thinking about risk as part of um, like the consequences of our actions and then so we should incorporate that into our kind of utility calculations or um, determining which acts are optimal given our credences and preferences and so on. I don't know, could you briefly just talk about how, um, about your approach there regarding risk and decision theory? Right. So, you know, I'm behind the general decision principle to maximize expected utility. And a good um, argument for that principle interprets it so that the possible outcomes of an act that yield its expected utility are comprehensive. A possible outcome covers everything that the agent cares about. And many people care about risk. And for a person who cares about risk, then an evaluation of a possible outcome of an act will include the risk that the act generates. So the act might be a gamble and the gamble generates some risk. And if the agent is averse to risk, then that risk that the act generates attaches to every possible outcome and lowers an evaluation of those possible outcomes. So some accounts of expected utility um, don't use outcomes that are comprehensive. Using outcomes that are comprehensive makes it less likely that they'll occur as a result of many different acts. If they're comprehensive possible outcomes, they'll be fine grained in a way that makes it less likely that multiple acts will yield the very same fine grained possible outcome. And if you want to measure um, an agent's probabilities and utilities, it's easier to do that if there are acts that have the same consequences. So you can try to get a handle on an evaluation of a, a possible outcome. And then once you have that, use it to help you get an evaluation of uh, other acts that have the same possible outcome. But um, fine-grained or comprehensive outcomes are not very likely to be repeated by uh, as possible outcomes of many acts. So there's a, a measurement problem that comes up if acts are taken non, are taken comprehensively. And I think that leads some proponents of expected utility to take them non-comprehensively. But the motivation for maximizing expected utility is strongest if the possible outcomes of acts are comprehensive and include everything that an agent cares about. Um. Right. So, how does and and how are we thinking about risk in this in these cases? 
exactly. Um, well, there are, I think, multiple conceptions of risk in the literature. Um, I think risk in the ordinary sense is just the chance of something bad happening. Now, um, a gamble has a risk in that sense. It's got the prospect, it has the, if you, if you gamble, you've got the chance of losing money that you've wagered. And um, nonetheless, a person might um, want to make the gamble because the, the risk of the bad consequences outweighed by the prospect of gaining money. Now there's a, a conception of risk that I think comes up in the literature that's a, an overall evaluation of an act's exposure to chance. So some acts um, are sure to provide a certain outcome and other acts have possible outcomes of varying utility. And an act's exposure to chance is greater if um, it has acts of varying utility, then the outcome of the act depends on chance, which possible outcome is realized. So an, an overall measure of an act's risk might be the, um, the variance of its possible outcomes. So there could be um, some possible outcomes that are far from the average possible outcome and so contribute to a large variance for the utilities of possible outcomes. So that's one conception of risk and it attaches not to um, a particular, it arises not because of the bad consequences of a particular possible outcome, but because of all the possible outcomes of the act and their varying utilities. So I call that the act's risk as opposed to, you know, the risk of a bad outcome that comes from an act, but maybe is accompanied by compensating prospects for good outcomes. So an act's risk is a global assessment of the riskiness of an act and um, when you're thinking of risk in the ordinary sense, you just focus on one bad possible outcome and it's the risk of that possible outcome happening. So it's local as opposed to global. So both types of risk come up in decision-making. So the, the um, risk in the sense of a chance of a bad outcome that's used to get the expected utility of an act, but uh, the global risk, the act's exposure to chance um, is also used to get the act's utility. The, if it's got high variance of utilities of possible outcomes in the agents opposed to risk in this global sense, then that reduces the attractiveness of the act. Uh, right, right. Okay. I think I followed most of that. Um, so, so also in terms of, um, you, you read, you wrote this paper on, I know you've written uh, one of the books I mentioned in the, in the intro and probably some other things as well, where you're looking at risk more comprehensively, but you wrote also this one paper on, um, like thinking about risk as consequences. And as you say, kind of building those into, um, how we're calculating the utility of acts and so on. Um, correct me if I'm thinking about this incorrectly, but the thought might be um, the subject has their preferences or utilities for certain outcomes, um, perhaps conditioned on certain acts. And they also have their um, perhaps worries about risks or aversion to certain risks. Um, maybe they want certain risk, maybe. But, um, they could in principle like that as well. Um, and you're saying you want to, are you saying something like that you want to incorporate both of those features into our utility calculation or um, is that getting 
on the right track or how do you think about that? Um, right, so I mean, one way to distinguish between the two types of risk, risk in the local sense versus risk in the global sense is to think about requirements of rationality concerning such risks, attitudes to them. So um, a risk in the sense of chance of a bad outcome, um, rationality requires aversion to that. But um, the same requirement for aversion to risk in that sense doesn't carry over simply to aversion to risk in the sense of an acts risk in the global sense. A, a person um, may find that um, risk in the global sense has some attractions and so want to um, take on risk in that global sense. Rationality may permit it, even though it requires aversion to a chance of a bad outcome. So rationality is a little bit more tolerant concerning attitudes to risk in the global sense of an X risk than it is toward risk in the sense of a chance of a bad outcome. Uh, right. So when financial planners talk to their clients about investments, they want to find out about their attitude to risk and which investments make sense for the client will depend on how averse the agent is to risk. But um, rationality, you know, although rationality accommodates that difference among individuals concerning risks in the global sense, it, you know, rules out decisively um, attraction to risk in the sense of a chance of a bad outcome. Um, it rules out an intrinsic attraction to a risk of that sort. Okay, yeah, I think, I think that makes sense. I was thinking about um, also, um, could it not be, or is it not that um, the role that risk plays for an agent in their preferences is already kind of built in, it's already kind of built into their preferences over certain outcomes. So does that make sense? Like, uh, I don't know if you want me to elaborate on that or do you see where I'm coming from? Um, right, I think that's a view that you don't have to worry about taking account of risk. The expected utility formula does that. Um, but there are some cases where that formula doesn't seem to do a good job taking account of risk. There are cases, the most famous one of which I think is Allais paradox, where um, people, when they're evaluating gambles, and they do it just thinking about the monetary consequences of the gambles, will be led to um, they'll be led to um, preferences among gambles that seem inconsistent with the principle to maximize expected utility. So one example of this type that comes up in Kahneman and Tursky, that's not the same as the Lay's paradox, is um, a choice between a sure thing, $3,000, and a gamble that provides an 80% chance, four-fifths chance of $4,000. So some people would prefer the sure thing rather than the chance for the greater amount. And then you might ask them also to compare uh, one fourth chance of $3,000 with a one fifth chance of $4,000. And when they make that comparison, they might be attracted to the bigger amount. Um, but if expected utility took into account just monetary outcomes, their preferences would be inconsistent there. There would be no utility assignment to amounts of money such that both preferences maximize expected utility. So one reaction is that, well, 
the monetary outcomes are not comprehensive. They don't include the risk that the gambles generate and that the sure 3000 does not generate. And because the consequences are richer than possible monetary gains, um, when you take comprehensive outcomes into account, then you can reconcile the two preferences. It's an, an aversion to risk that yields the preference for the 3000 as opposed to the four fifths chance for the 4000. So I think if, um, you know, it, if you just rely on the expected utility principle to handle risk, it doesn't seem to do an adequate job in all cases, not in cases like a Lay's paradox. Okay, yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on what we're um, like inputting into the expected utility calculus, right? So if you wanna take the, um, you're just modeling the preferences as like varying linearly with mon monetary value, um, that might get it wrong because the person's actual preferences might not vary linearly, linearly with monetary value. Um, they might care, for example, much more about getting $3,000 and not getting nothing than getting potentially getting $4,000. Um, or, you know, you could have even more extreme um, cases than that. So I don't know. I guess I was thinking that if the person's preferences are actually not linear because of certain aversions to risk, um, that that's what would be fed into our decision theory or utility calculation, if that makes sense. Yeah. So in the example I gave, there's no utility function, not even a nonlinear one that makes the two preferences um, both follow maximum expect utility maximization, expected utility maximization. So one way of trying to take account of risk is to, yes, let the utility function for money be nonlinear. Um, but even doing that, um, attitudes to risk, I think are left out in an example like a Lay's paradox. So one way to handle those left out attitudes to risk is to let the possible outcomes be more comprehensive than monetary possible outcomes. Let them include the risks that gambles generate. And then if there's an aversion to those risks, you'll lower the desirability of the gamble. Yeah, okay, that, that seems reasonable enough, I suppose. Um, I mean, in principle, there could be other features involved in the act or the outcome that the subject might care about um, beyond just like monetary value. Um, and so, yeah, if you're gonna go about utility maximizing, you wanna incorporate those. Um, and one and some of those might be just the risk involved. You might just care not to have risk involved. That's the sort of thing mm -hmm. that you might want to think about. Right. So an objection to the approach I'm advocating that often comes up is that if you allow possible outcomes to be comprehensive, then it looks as though expected utility maximization imposes no constraints on decision makers. And the idea is that if possible outcomes are very fine grained, um, then you can always cook up an explanation for any preferences you observe so that according to the cooked up explanation, those preferences are maximizing expected utility. So, you know, if a person has a choice between uh, $5 and $10, um, you might say, and if the person takes the $5, the person is nonetheless maximizing utility because the person likes the look of the $5 bill better than the look of the $10 bill. But um, that sort of trivialization doesn't really arise in the approach I'm advocating because before you begin evaluating an agent, you find out what the agent cares about. And 
if the agent doesn't really care about the look of a $5 bill versus a $10 bill, then you're not gonna be able to drag it in to explain a preference for the $5 bill over the $10 bill. The person would be acting against preferences if they only care about say monetary outcomes and risk. If those were the only two things, then the look of the bill is ruled out as an explanation of the choice and the choice of the $5 bill is just irrational. It's contrary to expected utility maximization for the agent. Right, at, at best that would be some sort of, you know, post hoc rationalization maybe. Right. That really wasn't relevant to their preferences yeah. or credences at the time. Yeah. yeah, so I think some theorists are worried about post hoc rationalizations if outcomes were comprehensive and couldn't, could include things like risk that a gamble generates. All right, yeah, that's um, that's good stuff. So um, I'm not sure if there's something more that I want to go to on that. So yeah, so the stuff on imprecise credences and um, utilities, I found was um, very interesting as, as well. And um, so just as a, background for the uh, viewers on this. Um, a lot of work in decision theory um, and rational choice takes in credences or degrees of belief, if you prefer, that are represented like often numerically. Uh, you have the 50% credence in something or 100% um, credence in something, you know. Um, and similarly for, for preferences or utilities. But, um, what if, what if our preferences or credences are imprecise or maybe they comprise a range or we're not really sure where we would put it if they were gonna assign a um, precise value? Um, first of all, is this rational, can a, can a rational agent have um, preferences and credences like that? And second of all, how do we incorporate those in decision theory when a lot of existing um, approaches to decision theory involve I'm um, taking imprecise credences. So I don't know, you know, um, add more on that and talk about broadly where you're coming from there. Mm -hmm. Right, so I think a, a lot of standard decision principles make idealizing assumptions. And one way decision theory progresses is by relaxing those idealizing assumptions and generalizing decision principles to deal with the new conditions. So the principle to maximize the expected utility, it assumes that an agent does have precise credences and precise utilities, and they're used to calculate an act's expected utility. Um, but there's some circumstances in which it seems that it's rational for an agent not to have precise credences or precise utilities. Um, an agent might not have very much information about the weather and so not assign a precise credence to it's raining today. Um, there could be maybe a, a range of rational credences for the agent to assign. In general, when information is scarce, when there's not much of it, then precise credence um, may in fact not be warranted and rationality may even require an agent to have an imprecise credence. So putting aside the idealizations, you think about, well, what does decision theory have to say about rational choice if expected utilities are not available for possible actions? If the options in a decision problem don't have expected utilities, then there's no way to select among them according to the principle to maximize expected utility. Um, so a, a generalization that I think goes back at least to I.J. Good in the 50s says that our rational approach in those circumstances is to choose in a way that maximizes according to some credence function and utility function in the set of such functions, pairs of such functions that represent the agent's mental state. 
Yeah, very good. So um, I'll come. Um, I'm going to look at a ask a, about a few things there. Um, for, first, I was wondering. Um, I mean, here's the way that I'm thinking about precise, like any imprecise credences. Um, so our attitudes and credences, um, it's a complex psychological thing. Um, and when we come at it and say, okay, your credence is this, or, you know, um, or we model it with uh, um, in decision theory, I mean, it's, it's at best a model. And there's like a lot of idealizations, as you say, that are made and, um, you know, assigning a numerical value to this complex psychological um, feature might be in some cases too much of an idealization, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And maybe we wanna, the right way to model it, at least in some cases is to um, have a more relaxed or um, imprecise uh, value for thinking about what our credence is, if that makes sense. Is that, is that kind right. of how you're thinking about it? Right. So what I have in mind is a numerical representation of an agent's state of mind. Um, the representation has pairs of probability functions and utility functions. And whether some pair should be in the set representing an agent's mental state may be itself an imprecise matter. It may not be um, a routine matter to decide what pairs of probability and utility functions should be in the set representing an agent's state of mind. And which sets are best representations will depend on the use to which these representations are put. And so I have in mind their use in rational decision-making. And so with that purpose in mind, even though the set might be uh, inadequate for other purposes, it, it might be fine for um, use in reaching an evaluation of an agent's choices. Right, and so to repeat then, um, your, the conclusions you draw about this with regard to rationality are fairly permissive, right? So long as, there's some like representative pair or um, uh, of precise credence and, util and um, utility um, on which an action is uh, rational. That action is rational, if that makes sense. Um, you right. put that quite, quite right. Yeah. yeah, so sometimes I call the principle I have in mind the permissive principle because it does allow for the rationality of many acts, any act counts as rational if according to some pair in the representative set, the act maximizes expected utility. That's a fairly permissive standard. Now, I think decision theorists sometimes advance standards that are even more per permissive, but it's permissive relative to many of the principles in the literature. Yeah. Yeah, what do you think of the following sort of um, argument for a less permissive um, restriction, which would say something like, um, well, look, um, just considering credence as, as an imprecise, suppose um, utility is a precise just for simplicity's sake. Um, on the range of the credences that you have, okay, um, the ones kind of at the extremes are like, um, not really the optimal ones for you, or may maybe you should think of something like the median or the average as, as um, capturing, um, being a rep better representative of the, your actual credence function, or if that makes sense. Um, um, right, so you might think that the median is, um, the right probability function to use for rational choice is kind of compromised between the extremes and, and all the, the probability functions that are 
in that representative set. Um, but you know, if you think of the representative set as including only probability functions for which you don't have any good reason to rule them out, then there aren't any good reasons, I don't think, to, to rule out an action that's supported by one of those probability functions. If you've got no good reason to rule out one of them, then relying on it in rational choice seems permissible. Yeah, yeah, I guess I'm trying to think of how I might, um, that's how someone might try to motivate this, um, this sort of objection. Like maybe, like maybe some sort of, um, difference principle might make the like if so if you think suppose your credence was roughly between 0.4 and 0.6 in some mm -hmm. proposition um well like unless you have some other reason to prefer another sort of distribution maybe you should be kind of like um have uniform credence about what um the actual precise credence should be or something like that and if you do that, then it's, you might, um, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, right. Exactly so, I mean, suppose you use the median. And so, um, accordingly, you think you should choose the act that has maximum expected utility, assuming that the relevant probability is 0.5. Then rationality would be giving you instructions no different than it would give you um, if you had a range of reasonable probability assignments. It would be treating your choice the same as a choice made when you've got good evidence for assigning a precise probability of 0.5 to the relevant event. Um, so it seems intuitively, I think that imprecision should make a difference to what's rational to choose. And what's rational to choose shouldn't reduce to what's rational if you were to have a precise probability. Yeah, I might, I might have to think about it a bit more, but I guess that sort of makes sense. I mean, there might be other ways. Are there other ways you might relax it in a bit um, so that maybe it's a little bit more permissive, but not, quite as permissive as what you have in mind, or I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm sure there are intermediates, but um, once you get on the slippery slope, then I think you slide down to the permissive principle. One thing to note is that, you know, the principle is meant to evaluate acts only after the agent has done as much as rationality requires um, assessing probabilities and utilities. And then also, it's meant to be applied to um, expected utilities that are calculated using comprehensive possible outcomes that include things like risk. So I think maybe some people think that if you were to use a probability at one extreme of the range, that you'd be maybe undergoing excessive risk and they're attracted to the median amount because it seems like that reduces risk. But possible outcomes are comprehensive, I'm imagining, and so already include risk and aversion to it if there is any. Right. If if so, if one of those um, credence utility pairs um, was such that it involved too much risk, it already it wouldn't already be included in um, your, your range of acceptable. Um, right. Right. Yeah. Taking I'm a comprehensive approach. Narrow down the range of accepted utility assignments. Right. Um, this is sort of uh, somewhat inessential, but like, in addition to being the um, credence being somewhat imprecise, could it be that like the boundaries are somewhat imprecise too? And then there's a question of whether some credence utility pair is or isn't part of the um, range of acceptable values, or is vagueness not really into it? Into it? Right. Um, 
you know, I think often it, it won't be clear whether some probability utility pair should be in the set representing an agent's state of mind. Um, and, you know, the unclarity about that could carry over to unclarity about whether a choice is rational for the agent or not. Okay, but, yeah, yeah. So th the main claim is that, you know, given uh, an acceptable representation of an agent's state of mind for the purposes of making decisions, some choices utility maximizing according to a uh, probability utility function pair in the set, then it's rational. So there are assumptions that the principle uses. And, you know, for starters, you've got an acceptable representation of the agent's state of mind, acceptable at least for the purposes of evaluating choices. And there could be, you know, as I mentioned, some vagueness about what's acceptable and then some corresponding vagueness about which choices are rational for an agent. Right, okay, that, yeah, that seems like the right outcome, right? If the, um, if for certain, states or um, um, this like unclear whether how to whether they're covered under our credences in a certain way then it's like it, it's going to be unclear whether um, there's a normative requirement to act in a certain way upon them and it's, a, it's sort of like if you're feeding into your decision theory or decision rule something that's like too too imprecise to really give a recommendation for, then you know, you're not going to get a recommendation out. Um, mm -hmm. so that's maybe the one way to put it. Yeah. So you know, I think the way I would put it is that it'd be unclear whether the principle um, condones some act or not. So the principle itself, I think, would be clear, but whether an act accords with the principle or not might be unclear. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that might be a better way to put it. Um, so another thing you've talked about, you talk about in there is about um, you know exploring what um, uh, an ideal, an ideally rational agent would do, um, and what sort of credences and preference structures they would have. And one thing you talk about is how complying, or you argue for, it, is that complying with uh, the probability axioms, the Kamora probability axioms, is uh, intrinsically good from an epistemic perspective, like satisfying additivity and other stuff like that. Um, I don't know, could could you elaborate a bit on that? I, I, for for my purposes, I'm not sure really how to understand like intrinsic goodness in the sense. <laughs> um, uh, so. Yeah, one project that people working with decisions and probability take on is um, arguing for the laws of probability and in particular the axioms of probability since they entail the other laws. And there are different ways people have tried to argue for them. Um, probably the best known is the Dutch book argument. Any violation of the laws of probability makes an agent vulnerable to a sure loss system of bets. So it seems like instrumentally good to avoid that vulnerability and so to have um, a probability assignment that conforms with the, the laws of probability, the axioms in particular. Um, but there are other arguments. So some arguments use graded accuracy and argue that if you're um, credence assignment, your probability assignment conforms to the axioms, then um, there won't be any other assignment sure to improve accuracy, the accuracy, the graded accuracy of your assignment. So the different ways of arguing. And um, in the book we're talking about, I use an argument that's based on coherence. So I think that the axioms of probability present standards of coherence for degrees of belief. 
so it'd be incoherent to have to fail to have maximal degree of belief in a tautology. Granted that you know you've got uh, well the agent is cognitively ideal and can spot that the proposition is a tautology. So my argument for the axioms appeals to coherence. And the reason I like that style of argument is that I think it extends to cases in which probabilities and utilities are imprecise and you're using a set of probability and utility functions to represent an agent's mental state. So a question comes up, why should the representation use probability functions that comply with the laws of probability? Why not some probability functions that violate the axioms of probability? What rules that out? And I think the co coherence requirements for precise credences carry over to the case of imprecise credence. The Credence assignments in the set representing the agent's mental state um, have to be coherent in order for the representation of the mental state to be coherent. So I'm, that's for the reason I appeal to coherence in arguing for the probability axioms. It's the kind of argument that extends straightforwardly to probability assignments in a set used to represent uh, an agent's state of mind when no single probability assignment is a good representation. Yeah, yeah, would, would you construe the um, kind of coherence requirement instrumentally or like non-instrumentally um, as like a norm of good? Um, yeah, I think it's a, a non-instrumental norm of rationality. It's a um, requirement for rational degrees of belief. Now, you know, you could imagine cases where it would be instrumentally good to violate those norms, but um, someone might be handsomely rewarded for violating the norms that apply to credences and so instrumentally good to violate them, but they're, um, they're non-instrumental norms of rationality for degrees of belief. So I think that in the literature, there are proponents of this view. Um, Ramsey under one interpretation takes the probability axioms to be norms of coherence. And he uses the Dutch book argument just to dramatize the bad results of incoherent degrees of belief. And Brian Skirms is another probabilist who argues for compliance with the axioms of probability by taking them to be norms of coherence. And, and Brad Armand is another one. So it's not as though this approach to the axioms is novel with me, it's in the literature. Um, this way of arguing for compliance with the axioms is a supplement to the other ways of arguing that appeal to graded accuracy or pragmatic reasons like those that come up in Dutch book arguments. Yeah, I guess I guess for me, the way I might think of it is that we might like stipulate that um, like when we like use the word rationality or rational, um, there are certain requirements that something must satisfy to count as rational. Or um, other than that, there are other things that are like instrumental to our various aims um, and acting in accordance with those is instrumentally rational. I'm not sure I understand um, when we say, well, it's like intrinsically valuable, like at least epistemically beyond either of those two um, facts that we might have in mind. Um, did, maybe do you see where I'm coming from or what do you think about that? Uh -huh. So I think questions come up about the, the value of being rational. And my claim isn't that it's valuable to an agent to comply with the norms of rationality. 
the norms of rationality are applied to evaluate what the agent is doing. Maybe what the agent's doing is irrational, um, but not for instrumental reasons, not because it doesn't promote what the agent values. So the, the norms of rationality are, I think, independent of what the agent values. So in decision-making, sometimes in dealing with cases like Newcomb's problem, um, theorists have argued that the problem is set up so that rationality is penalized. So it could be that in Newcomb's problem, the rational choice is not instrumentally best if an agent could get him or herself to act contrary to principles of rationality in that case. There's a reward for doing that. It's instrumentally good to depart from the norms of rationality to violate them. So the claim I'm making is not that it's always promoting the values of an agent to comply with norms of rationality. The norms are used to evaluate the agent, belief, desires, acts um, in a way that doesn't require the agent to value being rational and to value complying with those norms. So often it's instrumentally good to be rational, but there are certain special circumstances in which it may not be instrumentally good to comply with principles of rationality. Okay, yeah, that's that's a, a very interesting way to put it. Like, um, I think I remember in, in that in that uh, book, I think it was, if I remember correctly, it was footnote like forty six. You bring up um, some of the uh, an issue related to what you just said, which is that wait a minute, it might look like in Newcomb's case and maybe some others, um, like irrationality is rewarded in some way. Um, now, I might wonder what role the like real norms of rationality are meant to play here then. Because like for me, if in Newcomb's problem taking one box is like, with respect to those norms are rational, but like rewarded in some way and predictably so, like I can be pretty confident going in that if I take the one box, I'm probably going to get a million like mm -hmm. uh, okay if it counts as irrational <laughs> the irrational action is going to be reported probably in some sense that just seems to maximize my aims right i, I would rather be quote unquote irrational with respect to those um norms of rationality right so, yeah yeah so i think it's compatible with someone who claims that two boxing is the rational choice in newcomb's problem to also claim that if you have a chance to make yourself irrational before entering the problem by say taking some pill that makes you a one boxer, you should take the pill that you know irrationality is rewarded. And if you can make yourself choose irrationally, you should do that. That's the way to advance your goals. Um, so I think those two things are compatible um, the rational choice is two boxing, but if you have a way to make yourself a one boxer, doing that is the rational choice. But the, you, when you say make a way to make yourself a one boxer, you're not saying like before the prediction is made so that you're like predicted to be a one Yeah, boxer. before the prediction is made so that oh. the predictor can see that you are a one boxer and put the million dollars in the opaque box. Okay, but then you, you wouldn't say that this, like someone could rationally do this or, or might have pragmatic reason to do this after the prediction's already been made. No, then- I wouldn't take the pill then. Then making yourself a one boxer would just have bad consequences. You'd lose a thousand dollars by doing that. Um, but you know, if you can, before the prediction is made, turn yourself into a one boxer, then you should. That's the way to the million right. dollars, which is something you want. Right, okay, so 
so that case has something to do with like the rationality of perhaps plans or um, sequential problems or something like that. I guess it's not really a plan in the sense that you know in the case you're just taking a pill and that's might be rational for you to do so. And then as a result of that, later you do something which um, were you to evaluate that according to the norms of rationality, you wouldn't do it. But all the same, it was like made sense for you in the first case to set yourself up so that you would do something like that, if that makes sense. Right. That's how you go, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if I want to touch on Newcomb's problem because um, specifically, because like in my view, when you have the, um, you say that you would miss out on the the thousand dollars if you take only the one box. Um, to me, that that requires as, assessing the counterfactuals a certain way um, that I wouldn't assent to. Like I would say, well, had I taken both of the boxes, it's not that I would have gotten a thousand dollars more because um, I want to hold fix the details of the problem and. One of those details is the reliability of the predictor. Probably I would have been predicted to take both and so gotten a million dollars less or $999,000 less. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I tend to prefer the dominant style reasoning when the acts and states are probabilistically independent and not just causally independent, but I don't know. I, you probably know there's a huge literature on, on this stuff. Fairly right. Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, um, I'm a causal decision theorist. And so use the principle of dominance when the option chosen doesn't have any causal effect on the state that determines the outcome of the act. Yeah. Yeah. In, in principle, someone could say, as I might be inclined to, um, that's one way to apply dominance when the, the acts and states are causally independent. Um, but another way is to apply it when they're like evidentially or probabilistically independent. And like, how are we deciding which? Um, if you're committed to like causal decision theory or something which entails it, then you'll go with the causal dominance, but um, I, I'm I'm not to like I I don't know. There's further discussion to be had there, I guess. Yeah, I mean it's a big topic. There's a um, long-standing debate between evidentialists and causal decision theorists, and probably you know I I can't say anything to resolve that debate now, but I lean toward causal decision theory because it seems that to me that. Um, you should pick an option because it will promote your goals and not because it produces a sign of goal promotion. You know, you should pick an act that's causally efficacious to um, your attainment of your goals. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the way one way I think about it is that I care about like having the money, not necessarily that my having the money is like a causal consequence of my action. Um, and if it turns out that acting in a certain way is correlated with having the money, um, that, you know, would be enough for me, <laughs> um, all else equal to, to act in that way. Like I, I tend to think that in Newcomb's case, for example, um, I can know ahead of time, or at least be pretty confident ahead of time, given the my knowledge about the problem that I'm facing, that if I choose one box, probably I'll get a um, million dollars or close to a million dollars on average. Right. And if I choose two boxes, I'll probably get a thousand dollars or close to a thousand dollars on average. And like predictably so, that's like something I can predict ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And I just want to choose the action that like predictably does better. It seems almost incoherent given my aims of rationality. Mm -hmm. um, or how I'm considering rationality, that the opt uh, rational action would be one which does predictably worse. That's how, that's how I would think about it. Right. Yeah, so I imagine that you're picking the one box and you're predicting that the result will be a million dollars. 
But also, you know that if you were to take both boxes, you'd have an additional thousand. And so why would it be rational to pass up the additional thousand? Yeah, well, for, for me, like um, assessing that depends on how we're gonna assess the relevant counterfactuals. Like if I were to take both and, um, and now people talk about, oh, are the counterfactuals backtracking or are they um, whatever? Yeah. Um, I, I tend to think about them in a way that is because I wanna hold in assessing the counterfactuals that I think are kind of relevant to deliberation how I would consider rational choice. There's some that are, I want to hold fixed the details of the problem, the things I like know are fixed in a way. Um, so the fact that I'm um, in this sort of situation, some prediction was made, I don't, I know not which, um, some amount of money's in the box, I know not how much. Um, and the predictor is pretty reliable. Um, and, you know, and I'm varying the choice that I make and asking, given the details of the problem and that my choice had been the other way, what's like likely to occur? Mm -hmm. um, and the way I would evaluate that is, yeah, the choice was, the prediction was probably the other way. Right. But, so, you know, yeah. I agree with you that how to analyze the conditionals that guide reasoning, that's important. And I think the, the conditionals that I think guide reasoning are the conditionals expressed in the subjunctive mood. So I think about what I would get if I were to do something. So in assessing what I would get if I were to do something, I take into account my evidence of how things are now. And I use my evidence about that to figure out what would happen if I were to do something different, maybe something different from what I'm going to do. I know I'm going to pick the one box, and I, that gives me good information about the prediction and the contents of the opaque box. And then knowing those circumstances, I think, well, what would happen if I were to take both? And the answer seems to be I'm up a thousand dollars. And that's a benefit that to me, I irrationally forego if I pick just the one box. So I do use you know, information about the circumstances, but um, that's in order to get to assessment of acts, including acts that I know I won't perform. I might know I'm, I'm not gonna take two boxes, but still I can see from what I do know that if I were, I'd gain a thousand. Yeah, you could still ask like, what if I did, you know, even if I'm not going to. Like but, I so I know that if I were if I were to take both boxes, that wouldn't change the prediction, that wouldn't change the contents of the opaque box. Um, what would change if I were to take both is my information. If I were to take both, then I would know I'm taking both. And using that information, I would have you know, a different view about what prediction had been made and what the content of the opaque boxes. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to dwell on this too much because there's a couple right. of things I want to get to before we close. But I did want to mention, like, I again, I'm I'm perfectly fine um, assessing these questions in the subjunctive mood. Um, like, the question is, in terms of the subjunctives that are relevant to rationality, um, are we going to hold? are we holding fixed like the actual contents of the box or like what we think the contents of the box in fact is when evaluating the counterfactuals, like how do you chosen this other way or were mm -hmm. it to choose the way that I'm pretty sure I won't choose. Um, like in the case at hand, suppose, you know, you're confident that you're a one boxer and you ask, but well, what if I were to choose two, how much would I get, um, you know, you're holding fixed that there's a million dollars in there, for example, right? And saying that you would have gotten a million and a thousand, right? But you know, you could evaluate the kind of factors in a way which doesn't hold that fixed. And the question is, which of those ways to evaluate it are relevant to rationality? Mm -hmm. But yeah, right? Yeah, I think that's the crux of the difference. Mm 
Um, so I'm thinking if you know you're going to pick one and, and you're thinking about what would happen if you were to pick two, then um, you realize that if you were to pick two, you would get different evidence about the prediction that's been made. But um, you wouldn't change the prediction and you wouldn't change the contents of the box. So that's the, the causal element as opposed to the evidential element. Well you, well, you wouldn't cause it to be any different, but I think that leaves open whether it would have been any different because um, it's depending on the sort of counterfactuals kind of factuals one says. Yeah, it depends on yeah. um, how you evaluate those counterfactuals. So in the, the closest worlds, yeah. um, <laughs> right. no change and, in the contents of the box. Anyway, that's good. I, I, I could sort of talk about this stuff all day, but I want to- Yeah, a it's fun things, to talk about, but- A couple yeah. other things before we wrap up, because I know uh, we're coming up on uh, over an hour, almost an hour and a half. So um, yeah, um, I did want to talk about, so I think you've already, written about how sequential, I mentioned this earlier, sequential decision problems and like planning. And you've, sa you've said something of the sort that a sequence is rational um, if all the like steps that make it up are rational, something like that. So right. you're kind of about the compositionality of uh, mm -hmm. rationality for sequences. Um, right. Yeah, do you want to add on that or is that more or less capture the idea? Um, yeah, that's the main idea. So um, because all the acts in the sequence aren't in the agent's direct control. The agent has to wait for the right time to perform them. Can't just presto perform all the acts in the sequence. Then the way of evaluating them is compositional. Look at the status of the acts forming the sequence. And if they're all rational, then I would say the sequence is rational. An alternative way of evaluating the sequence is to see if with respect to rival sequences, the one performed maximizes utility. Now, I think the standard of utility maximization is the right one for acts that are in an agent's direct control, but for acts that are not in an agent's direct control, like a sequence, then the compositional standard is appropriate. And that's because the agent can perform the sequence only by performing each act in the sequence. And um, to be rational, the agent has to act rationally at each step in the sequence and perform the act that is utility maximizing at the time it's performed. So it could turn out that doing that doesn't yield a sequence that's optimal, that maximizes among rival sequences. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's right. And this and this is compatible with um, with them potentially deciding to do something at the outset that might influence how they would choose later on, like taking a pill or so that sort of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So that's all consistent with that. It's just that supposing, like leaving those aside, you want to evaluate the rationality of the sequence by the rationality of its parts, more or less. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did have. Um, a sort of um, paradox that seemed kind of relevant to this because, so a few weeks ago, I talked with um, Professor Michael Humer and on some of the stuff in his books, uh, book Paradox Lost. And one of the paradoxes that he covers is the, obviously this is also in the literature as well, um, the self-torturer paradox, um, which goes like this. Uh, you have someone that's given a choice um, a thousand times in a row. This is, it, it, they're going to make a thousand choices. It's a big sequence. And each choice um, is between, uh, if, if they accept the $10,000, they get a slight but imperceptible increase in uh, pain. Uh, so they can't tell the difference between the pain if they accept it that just for that once. Um, and so well, it's an imperceptible difference in pain, so they'll want to accept the ten thousand dollars in in um, uh, in payment for for accepting that pain. However, um, they can also be pretty confident that if they accept the offer for all on a th all a thousand occasions, they're going to be receiving a level of constant pain that's 
just far too much for them to bear. Um, worth more than the $10 million, whatever, that they would get if they were to do it. But okay, there's something kind of paradoxical about this, if, if I've expressed this right, which is that it seems that it was rational on each occasion to take the offer, but that they ended up and predictably ended up in a, a situation which was um, very undesirable. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, did I explain that right? Or what, what do you think about yeah. that? So, yeah, I think the context for the problem matters. So suppose that the agent, the self-torturer, um, has an opportunity to bind himself to stopping after a certain amount of money comes in and before getting to the unbearable pain for which he'd pay any amount to be free of. Um, so if the agent can bind himself to stopping at some point where he's got a reasonable amount of money, then yes, he should bind himself to stop. So sometimes it's um, rational for an agent to impose limits on him or herself. Um, you know, a person might um, go into a bar and decide, well, one drink and that's it. And imposing a limit like that can be beneficial. The agent might know that without binding, then one drink leads to another and before that too long, um, there's not gonna be any work done tomorrow. So I think um, binding is, is very useful and rational agents do that. They bind themselves to certain courses of action to prevent themselves to getting into a mess. Yeah. Okay. Um, I like the idea of binding, but if so, if the person doesn't bind them, uh, bind themselves, um, and they were to go through this, would the would we have to say, in that case, that like sequence was rational, um, even though yeah. they ended up in that? Yeah. So you know, it depends on what type of evaluation we're looking for. So I distinguish between comprehensive rationality and conditional rationality. And um, an act is comprehensively rational if the agents, um, if that act is rational for the agent, considering that the agents made full use of opportunities to put him or herself in a good position to make it a choice. So for comprehensive rationality, an agent has to have rational degrees of belief or rational utility assignments and has to have made use of prior opportunities to control the decision situation they're in. So in the case of the self-torture, at a moment when the person chooses an increment in pain, that choice is rational in um, a non-comprehensive sense, just thinking about the circumstances and, and putting aside what went before and whether the agent did the best possible to um, control the decision problems and the decision situations he or she's getting into. So uh, that's how I would try to deal with that issue. I'd wanna distinguish between types of evaluation and the agent may be um, rational given the circumstances but not comprehensively rational because the agent should have changed the circumstances and should have bound himself to stopping before the unbearable pain came. Yeah, okay, so that's, that makes sense. It's actually kind of similar to what um, Humor had to say about it, which is that um, you should kind of, like if you were to rationally reflect on um, the situation you know you're going to face like um you should try to estimate what the given your pain tolerance and monetary preferences what the best trade-off for you would be between amount of money and amount of pain and it might be somewhat vague but the point is it's going to be somewhere not at the extremes and um you should kind of try to bind yourself to stopping around that point um right and that could potentially could potentially update that if you've on experiencing some of the pain because that might give you a better idea of what the actual amounts of pain there are and so on but 
Right. Yeah, so I go along with that approach to the problem. Right. Yeah, okay. That, that makes sense to me. But if you're, it, and, but that consideration um, involves, uh, or assessing the rationality in that way is, makes it a bit broader. And then like in the narrower sense, you, okay, the sequence mm -hmm. might be rational um, if the person doesn't bind themselves because each right. of the sequence, yeah. Yeah, there are different sorts of assessments for rationality. Some of them are conditional and there are different ways of making assessments of rationality conditional. Um, one way that interests me is taking something for granted. So a person's beliefs may be irrational, but you might say, okay, let's take them for granted and then think about what's rational um, doing that. And sometimes, uh, that's a common form of evaluation. We take some things for granted and we don't challenge the person's choice because it rests on irrational beliefs if we're taking those beliefs for granted. Yeah, yeah that's very good. Um, so there's obviously more things I could cover here and um, we could probably talk <laughs> all day on some of these things, but um, I did want to wrap up and one, I usually, as a kind of wrapping up question, I like to ask guests what they think some of the um, value of philosophy is both to them and generally, and maybe maybe specifically on the sort of philosophy that you concern yourself with on like decision theory and, um, and uh, related things. Like what's, what's value about that? What, what's worth doing about that and so on? And what do you yeah. think about that? Right. So one of the you know, questions that gripped me when I was growing up is, you know, how should I lead my life? It seemed like there were lots of opportunities, lots of things I could do. Um, and I wondered how to go about selecting a course in life. And there are various ways to do that. And one is to apply standards of morality, think about what makes for a morally good life and be guided by them. But Another standard to apply is what's rational to do. Um, not quite the same standard as standard morality, but still normative. And, and I thought that I could get you know, a better handle on standards of rationality than on standards of morality, that my prospects for discovering appropriate standards of rationality were, were better. So I focused on them and you know, it's helped me in life. I think that um, early on, I became convinced of the value of probability as a guide to life. That saying goes back to Bishop Butler. Um, and um, I made that saying my own. Um, I use probability as a, a guide to life. And it's been valuable for me that way. A lot of advice about what to do is non-probabilistic, but the advice seems better if you make it probabilistic, if you take probability into account. Yeah, yeah I definitely resonate with that. And um, I think that's a good way to put it, but yeah, thanks. Thanks uh, so much for being here and uh -huh. taking my questions and engaging thoughtfully on these issues. Well, it's been a great time talking with you. Um, um, you've got an interest in decision-making, decision theory, and it was, you know, um, good to have an exchange with you about things.